As Pastor Joe mentioned, it's always a joy to gather together on Sunday mornings. You know why we worship on Sunday, right? Yes. Joe does. <laughs> on Sunday morning, which comes after... Okay, you guys are almost there. Jesus died on Good Friday. If you know anything about calendars in ancient history, it's not the same as the calendar in iCal and Google. The way days and times were calendarized and kept track of have changed over centuries and millennia. On a Good Friday, Jesus died. Spent three days in the tomb. You've heard people say, how can that be? Well, you don't have a good understanding of how time and days are measured over centuries. Believe it or not, America wasn't always there. How many of you guys knew that? There were other civilizations, other generations, other cultures. But on a Sunday, Jesus Christ, Christ is not the last name, it's a title, it means the anointed one, the special one, the unique one, the different one, the Messiah, the promised one, rose from the dead. And did you know that Sunday is actually not meant to be part of your weekend. Did you know that? Sunday, your weekend is Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Here's what's so amazing. On the first day of the week, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So here's what I do. I like to rhyme because I have a lot of kids and I got to remember stuff. I hope they remember stuff. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, so on Sunday I get out of bed and I worship him because he's not dead. <laughs> That's why I'm here, because Jesus rose from the dead. So when you come to church, don't look like death, right? Like, you don't have to be salty, you don't have to be sad, you don't have to be somber. Jesus is alive. Yes or no? Yes. yes. I think our faces should look like it, don't you? I think our, our singing should have some sense of like, oh, we're here because he's alive. And our learning, our learning should be influenced by that. Why are we here now in these next uh, 37 minutes and 8 seconds? Here's why. To listen to the word of God so that we can learn the word of God, so that we can live by the Spirit of God, within the correcting and confirming agent of the Word of God. Does that make sense? Yes. You have been born again. Therefore, God's Holy Spirit is within you. But how do we know if the Lord's leading me to do thus and so? Uh, black and white and sometimes in red. God's Spirit will never go against God's Word. And God's Spirit is always confirmed, or what you think is God's Spirit, corrected by God's, maybe you can finish the sentence, it rhymes with bird, God's word. So you're not here to listen to me. I don't have a very like awesome series that's three weeks long and 38 seconds minute. You know, it's, we're going to go through the book of Daniel and listen and learn from God's word so that we can live by the Spirit of God within the boundaries of the Word of God. And God's Word is always, always, like peanut butter and jelly, always spirit and word go together to correct and to confirm. So, here's what we'll do. Today, we'll be in message number three of our series entitled, Countering Culture, Courage to Go Against the Culture. And it's just a series through the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. And we're looking at this ancient piece of literature in two portions. And I want to submit to you that it's in the two portions in which it's presented. It's about the prophet and his friends, chapters 1 through 6, and the prophecies, chapters 7 through the end. The book of Daniel, in this series, as we're considering the prophet and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and you remember Fidel Gomez's description, one bad amigo, right, Abednego. 
We're considering how they lived. And they lived very surrendered lives unto God. Why? They were captives. They were in a foreign land of Babylon. They lived in a very strange land where they were no longer free. They were held captive. So in a very real way, their day to day was surrendered. Whatever my captor says, but also their hearts. No, 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 no. God has me where he has me. And I live surrendered unto him. Listen, let me share this with you if I may. Living surrendered unto God is the way that your life begins to counter culture. Have you ever met someone that's combative just for combativeness sake? That's not fun. That's a porcupine. A lot of points, but no friends. No one wants to be around them. Like, do-do-do-do. Like, nobody likes porcupines. We're not called to counter culture because we're like, man, Christian nationalism, we got to keep it going. No. We live surrendered lives unto Jesus because he is Savior and Lord. But here's what happens. Over time, if you live by the Spirit of God within the correcting and confirm, confirming confines of the Word of God, your life begins to look different than the culture around you. Just naturally, the supernatural begins to happen. You start to look at money very differently. You start to look at time very differently. You start to look at life very differently. It's like Peter said. Let me read it to you. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And this is, I love the tenderness of Pastor Peter. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. I mean, everyone in life is not my friend. Every algorithm is not necessarily intended to enhance my life. No. Romans 12, the Apostle Paul, he would write this. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God. Why should I do that? Because of all he's done for you. What should life look like? Here's what it should look like. Let your body, let your life be a living and holy sacrifice. That's the kind he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but, but let God transform you, transform you, transform you, change you. The only consistent thing in life is change. And I love Bob Rockwell. Some of you may know that name. He would tell me. He did my premarital counseling with Cece and I before we got married. And he had this great one-liner. Neil, when you're done changing, you're done. <laughs> my mom puts it this way. Let's be firmly flexible. <laughs> right? I think we had a shirt some time ago. Yeah. My mom says, yes, she likes that shirt. <laughs> Transform you. How does this happen? How does this transformation happen? Read the Bible. But let God transform you into a new person. How does that happen? We're going to put it back up on the screen. By changing the way you, what does it say? T-I-T-H-I-N-K. By changing the way you think. Christianity is very much a lifestyle of leaning in and constantly learning. Because when you're done learning, you're done. By changing the way that you think. If nothing's changed in the way that you think in the last 30 days, one year, five years, 20 years, well, is transformation happening? What should be my filter? The Word of God. Then you will learn and know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We are saved by God from sin. 
and we're given new purpose and meaning. Our lives are no longer our own. We're surrendered to Him. Our values, how we define success, where we spend our time, what we prioritize. Listen to me, please. Jesus changes everything, or He's changed nothing. Over time, things begin to change. I have six children. Over time, they have changed. Why? They're alive. They go through seasons. And just as newborn babes spiritually, so do we. You see, and the more and more we spend time with the Lord, the more and more we surrender to Him. And the things that used to be normal to us, they begin to grow strangely dim. I remember my father sharing this last Sunday when he first came to know Jesus. And he had, it's not my words, you can go to you know, the message and listen. I'm not, you know, here's what he said. He said, this isn't me, don't blame me. He said that he didn't think he would ever give up weed. Like that was his life before Jesus. Can you imagine Pastor John Spencer coming up here and going, hey? <laughs> no, absolutely not. His life has changed radically because of Jesus, radically. The things that used to be normal to him, oh, that will always be a part of my life. They become strangely dim. Can you even imagine that happening today? No. Why? Because like Peter encourages those early believers, like Paul does, we are temporary residents. We're foreigners. We're pilgrims. That's our perspective on life. We're not seeking to build, 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 gain, 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 grow, 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 just to enjoy the here and now. We believe that the greatest return on investment is yet to come. The life after this life. That takes faith. It takes faith. And here's the deal. As we go through this book, we're going to be witness to a guy like Daniel who lived a surrendered life over to God in a very strange land. He didn't retreat from the world. It's just getting bad out there. He's got to hunker down. But he lived a godly life in the world, and he had great impact. Living a surrendered life. Living counter culture. You know, last week we gave out some of these little wristbands. And you guys took them all. They're all gone, which is great. So we made some new bands. You say, why do we have these little bands? A couple reasons. It helps remind us of the truth that we're learning and leaning into together as a congregation. Hopefully it reminds you to pray for your church. Lord, I pray for our congregation. Lord, that as we live surrendered to you, that you'd place us in places where we're countering culture. But also, this may not work. Maybe it will. Take one on behalf of another person and be praying. Can you imagine what the culture would look like if every Christian had an each one reach one mindset? I'm going to start praying for one person that I know that's far from God to come to know Jesus. And to be reminded of that name, I'm going to wear one of these bands and pray for that person. Now, if you do that, it's dangerous, because here's what's happened to me when I've done things like that. There's this guy named God who works things behind the scenes. And I could be praying for someone, like, oh, I'll never see that person. And like a week later, oh, my goodness, there's that person. Maybe God's wanting to use me. No, he could never use me. Uh, no, he will begin to order your days if your days are surrendered over to him. Can you imagine what Gulf Breeze would look like? If the thousand people, kids, students, and adults that gather here on a Sunday morning said, what if I just began praying for one person? And I'll let the Lord do the work. I mean, he's the one that saves, but he does want to partner with me in the ministry of the gospel in my community. And I don't know about you, but I need reminders. Maybe this could help me be reminded to pray for a person. And should they come to know the Lord or should they come to, know, come to church? You say, hey, I, I want to give you this. I was praying for you. I want you to be reminded and know that I as an individual in our church care about you. That's why we have these little bands. Now this morning, 
We're halfway into Daniel chapter 2, so we're going to pick up the story right where we left off last week. Last week, we saw that the king had a dream. He gathered his dream team to, to recall and interpret this dream for him, and he gave this ultimatum. If you can't do this, if you can't tell me the dream that I had and also provide its interpretation, you're going to be torn limb from limb. And Daniel, one of the members of this dream team, kind of the second string at this point in his life, we saw that he responded with great wisdom and discretion. And as he did, God revealed to him the king's dream and the interpretation. See, last week we kind of saw how Daniel processed what he was confronted with in a very unexpected, uncertain, and scary situation. This morning, we'll see how he responds, not reacts, but responds in this very unexpected, uncertain, scary situation. Anyone ever been in one of those? Okay, well, let's pray for that, that right now we would learn from God's Word how to process and respond when we too encounter uncertain situations. Father, I pray as we open your word that you'd open our hearts. Lord, that this congregation of human beings would lean in to what your spirit says through your word. Help me to serve them well. Lord, I pray as we read your word and just make a few observations, God, that you would speak. But please don't let it end there. Lord, please, I'm asking you, Lord, Help us to live these truths, to allow them to transform us. Please help our team here at the church know how we can better encourage and edify and exhort and train and resource your people as they live on mission right here in this culture. And I pray that this time in your word would be part of that process. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 24, chapter 2, reading from the New Living Translation this morning. We're going to have those verses for you up on the screen. New Living Translation says this. Then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel said to him, don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. Well, Arioch quickly took Daniel to the king. Listen to what he says. There's got to be a ton of excitement in his voice. I have found one, one of the captives from Judah who will tell the king the meaning of his dream. That's a lot of promise to the king. Let's read on what happens. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? And listen to how Daniel responds. There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. Arioch's going, oh no, right? <laughs> but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. Verse 29, while your majesty was sleeping... You dreamed about coming events. And he who reveals secrets has shown to you what's going to happen. And it's not because I'm wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but listen to the focus. But because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. Now, we're going to pick up what Daniel has to say in a few moments. But I, I got to share this with you. You got to love how Daniel handles himself in this situation. He's in a tight spot. He tells Arioch that God has revealed the dream and its meaning to him. So Arioch takes the king, takes Daniel before the king. I got a guy for you, king. Nebuchadnezzar the king asked Daniel, is this true? And Daniel basically responds with, there's actually no one that can do what you've asked. Arioch has to be shaking in his Babylonian boots at this point, right? He's thinking, I thought you said you could interpret and Daniel shares, no, 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 it's God who wants to reveal this. It's him. And there's a powerful lesson for us in this, and it's not one that I have time to belabor, but I believe that the word of God does. 
Remember who Daniel is, a stranger living in a strange land. He's a young man who's seeking to live his life surrendered over to the Lord in a world that's very foreign to him. And he models something for us that I believe we must grasp as Christians living in a world that is constantly becoming more and more and more worldly. Here's the truth. Know who you are and know who you aren't. Did you catch what Daniel said? He basically says, it's not me. It's God. He is the one who reveals mysteries. He's revealed this dream, and, and my confidence is not in myself, but it's in him. Now, as believers, I am very tempted in this moment to, to share with you so many truths about who you are as a believer and who you're not because of Jesus. Paul wrote entire books about this, the book of Ephesians. But for the sake of time and the sake of your seat, because the mind only endures what the seat can handle, let me give you just a few words to remember. You're forgiven. Do you live that way? Do you own that truth? That I'm forgiven before God because of Jesus. I don't live with a guilt and shame complex. I live with a sensitivity to his spirit when I'm wrong and I'm corrected and there is sorrow and repentance and grief, but I don't walk in shame because I'm forgiven. I'm free from the power of sin. The habits, the hang-ups, the issues, the challenges that are present within all of us, I believe that Jesus can set me free from that. I'm forgiven. I'm free. I'm not alone. God has placed me into the body of Christ. There is a pathway to be known in his church. See, the goal of a church is never for everyone to know everybody. That's the wrong bullseye. I barely know all my kids' names. How am I going to know all? You know, like, <laughs> the goal in a church is not that everybody knows everybody. No. The goal in a church is that everybody is known. That's the goal. It's not meant to be a show. It's not meant to be a presentation. It's meant to be a community. So as you join a small group, as you come to a worship service, as you join a serve team, you are given opportunity to be known. But those who should have friends must first show themselves what? Friendly. Friendly. If you step into a community looking for friends, you've already stepped off with the wrong foot. No, that's not how you do it. You step into a community, community to be a friend. That's how you find friends. But if you step into a community going, are they going to talk to me? Are they going to come see me? Are they going to notice me? You've already stepped off on the wrong foot. That's why it's wobbly. But if you step into a community and go, hey, how about not make this about me? How about I make this about you? How can I serve you? How, how can I let you go out the door before me? We would never leave this room if we practiced those Christians' truths because as we got to the end, of, oh, no, after you, no, after you, no, after you, right? <laughs> but as a Christian, you've been given the opportunity to be part of a family. And the goal of a church is not that everyone knows everybody, but the goal of a church is that everyone is given the opportunity to be known. And you have that here. You truly do. You're forgiven, you're free, you're part of a family, but also you're given a new focus in Jesus. And life is about not this. Life's not about this. What's right in front of me? It's about what God's doing behind the scenes. It's about what he has yet to do. And that's what I'm living for. I have a brand new focus. And I also am given a function. Man, it's a bummer when you're not needed. You ever been in that situation? Where you're like, oh, you know, like a, an old lawnmower or something, and it's all broken down, and it's sad, and you don't need it anymore. And like, That's not you. You have been given gifts that are spiritual. You have been given natural talents and abilities 
that God wants to use in his kingdom? Are you functioning in those? See, you're, you're forgiven. You're free. You're made part of a family. You're given a whole new focus. You have a function to play in the kingdom of God, and you have a future. Those are six things that I should say this. Then life should be fun to a certain degree. What do you mean by that? There should be an element of joy. Why? Because my circumstances dictate it? No. Who I am in Christ dictates that. I am forgiven. I am free. I've been made part of a family. I've got a brand new focus in life. I've got a function, a role to play, and I have a future. So I'm going to enjoy the life that God has given me. I'll take this day and rejoice in it because it's the day that the Lord has made. Again, I could belabor this point, but we must move on. The first truth that I hope that you take with you this morning, how do I, when I'm in a tight spot, like Daniel, when it's unexpected, uncertain, what do I do? Know who you are and know who you're not. You're not unforgiven. You're not shackled. You're not alone. You're not meaningless and purposeless. It's not the end. You have a future. And life doesn't have to be sad. Doesn't have to be. You have an element of influence over your ABCs, your attitude, belief, and choices. You do. But it does depend on your decisions and engagements and the friend group and the goals and the habits and the interests and the jokes and the kind of candy you eat. Or we just go down the whole alphabet if you want. But like, there is this dynamic that God is sovereign. And at the same time, he's so sovereign to give you free will and still remain sovereign. Figure that one out. Those are two parallel lines that only intersect in the mind of God. Again, we can't belabor this point, so we must move on. Let's pick up our storyline in verse 31. Here's what I'd like to do. I don't know if you can do this or not. This is intense. Can I read to you verse 31 through 43? That's a lot of Bible on a Sunday morning. Is that okay if we read that much Bible? This guy's giving a thumbs up. So that's the one guy that's still awake. So here we go. <laughs> Verse 31. Here we go. New Living Translation. We'll put it up on the screen. Here's Daniel recounting what's going on. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and its arms silver. Belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron. Its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. And as you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron and clay and bronze and silver and gold, and the, the wind blew them away without a trace like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock, the rock that knocked, that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That was the dream. Now, listen to this pronoun. We will tell the king what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty and power, strength and honor. He's made you the ruler over all the inhabited world. And he's put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You're the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third, represented by bronze, will, will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. The feet and toes you saw, they're a combination of iron and baked clay showing that this kingdom will be divided like iron mixed with clay. It'll have some of the strength of iron, but while some of the parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with, other, with each other through intermarriage. But they will not hold together 
just as iron and clay do not mix. There is so much gold that's going to be left on the ground as we go through Daniel chapter 2 today. There's so much in this that's rich that we just will not have the time to cover. We're not intended to in a Sunday morning sermon. But I want to share a takeaway truth that I hope that we can walk in as believers. And here it is. If the first is to know who we are and to know who we're not, to know that we're called to speak the truth and to speak it with tact. Did you see how Daniel so lovingly, so wisely, so clearly answers exactly what the king is asking, the dream and the interpretation? But he does it in such a way to show what I think true countercultural living looks like. Jesus modeled this perfectly where Jesus would be asked questions, seeking to entrap him. You know some of these questions. Jesus, should we pay taxes? Knowing that that question would divide his audience and get one group to hate him and one group to like him. And Jesus would say, give me a coin. Whose image? Caesar's. Well, why don't you render under Caesar's that which belongs to Caesar? And everyone just goes, wow. Sharing truth with tact. Here's what's interesting. What did Nebuchadnezzar see in his dream? Well, he saw a statue. What's interesting about that? They're in Babylon, the capital of idolatry. Statues are everywhere. And God speaks to an idolater in a language that an idolater can understand. He reaches down right where Nebuchadnezzar is and says, I'm going to speak your language to get the truth of what I'm trying to communicate to you. He would be very familiar with what he's seeing. This is a statue. I see these all everywhere. I know what this is. But he's asking, what does this mean? And here's what Daniel says. These represent kingdoms. This statue that you saw. And you also saw a big rock, right, Nebuchadnezzar? Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar's jaw? I guess this is exactly what I saw. Uh, and then he gives an explanation. Now hang with me. We're going to work through what he sees fairly quickly. So let me give you a picture. Anybody like pictures? I like pictures. Here's a picture of maybe what Nebuchadnezzar saw. First, we have the head of gold. And Daniel says, that's you, king. You're the head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar's got to go, all right, I like this guy. Daniel's awesome. I'm the head of gold. At that time, Nebuchadnezzar would have been at the peak of his glory. He governed the whole world and a nation that was actually called the city of gold. I'm going to leave the explanation for the head of gold right there. If you'd like more content about that, we print out the notes where there's more content. You can pick one up on your way out. But the second thing he saw was the chest, the chest and arms of silver. We're not told which kingdom this is, but in the dream, Daniel says, hey, your kingdom, that's the gold one. The next one to come was the Medo-Persian Empire, which stood for 208 years. And what's interesting is that Darius, the Mede, establishes a new kind of government during this rule and reign of the Medo-Persian Empire where every one of his captives will be demanded that they pay him by what kind of metal do you think? Rhymes with milver. Anyone think you know? Silver. So maybe the Bible's not so weird. Okay, well, the Babylonian, that was all about gold. Medo-Persian, that was all about silver. Well, what's next? Well, the belly and the thighs of bronze. In 334 B.C., Alexander the Great took over the Medo-Persian Empire And this empire stood for 185 years. The metal of that empire that was most commonly known and descriptive of that time, can you take a guess? Bronze. Historians call them the brazen-coated Greeks because the soldiers bore a new amalgam of metal on their chests and breastplates, their shields and their helmets. They were covered in bronze. Then the legs of iron. Again, We're not told who this is in this moment, but we have the opportunity to look at this from a historical perspective. They're looking forward in Daniel's time. We're looking backwards. To us, it's history. 
And this description that's given fits the kingdom of Rome. Rome had a rule for more than 500 years. And this image shows a division split into two different legs. The Roman Empire divided into east and west in A.D. 395. And eventually, as the image depicts, it weakened and became brittle and fragmented. And then there's this fifth description, this fifth piece, the feet of iron and clay. And there are ten toes at the bottom of the image, partly iron and partly, does anyone remember? Clay. Ten toes. I want you to remember that because we won't cover it all today, but when we get to chapter 7, the same truth but with a different image will be communicated. You'll see a beast with ten horns. Same image you see in Revelation 17, a beast with ten horns. And the angel will tell John in Revelation to write these things. These, these ten horns which you saw are ten kingdoms. And ever since, please listen to this, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and Revelation chapter 17, for thousands of years, scholars have anticipated some form of a revived Roman empire. We will have much more to say about that as we walk through the book of Daniel. Now, for us, this image is history. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, the Roman empires. But from the time that this dream was given to its interpretation, it's prophecy. Prophecy. The Bible is not in the land of Nod. A sermon is given so you can sleep on a Sunday. Like, no. This is actual historical relevant truth that's rooted in archaeology, rooted in reality. And if the truths that it speaks of are true in reality, geography, archaeology, science, then you have no reason to doubt the spiritual truths that it communicates. They go together. That's why it's so important to have an individual like Jay Siegert in two, two weeks to evidence to you that, no, 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 this isn't all just fairy tale. This stuff is rooted in reality. And that which you can see in reality gives you enough of a platform to believe what it says spiritually. Now, Daniel communicates all this truth with tact. He gives the king exactly what he's looking for, the dream and the interpretation, but he speaks in such a way that's clear, that's honest. There's a sense of serenity. Majesty, you're the king, he says in verse 37. God's made you a, a ruler. You're the head of gold. Do you know what the Bible says about the way that we speak to one another, what it should be like? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Speak the truth with venom. Right? Isn't that what it says? No. Speak the truth with vitriol. Speak the truth with bitterness. Don't you remember the good old days? Speak the truth in love. Proverbs 25, 15 says this. By forbearance, by forbearance, patience, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue can break the bone. We speak the truth, but it's wrapped in wisdom. It's wrapped in the appropriate timing. It's wrapped with tact. Anyone ever failed in this? Anyone ever been married? Anyone ever had a kid? <laughs> now, Daniel explains the most memorable part of this dream. Look at verse 34. We'll put it up for you on the screen. As you watched, a rock cut from the mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them into bits. And the whole statue was crushed into small pieces. Everything's lying around everywhere, iron and clay and bronze and silver and gold. And the wind blows it without a trace, like, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock, the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain and covered the whole earth. Well, what does this mean? Look at verse 44. He explains it. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush these kingdoms into nothingness and will, let, will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushed to pieces the statue of iron and bronze and clay and silver and gold, 
the great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is certain. This separates the book that's in your lap or that's on your screen from the Tao Te Ching, from the Upanishads, from the Koran, from the Book of Mormon. A book that's rooted in this kind of prophetic declaration is unique all to its own. Warren Wearsby in seeking to give clarity to this portion of Scripture, says this, Jesus will return, destroy his enemies, and establish his kingdom. The stone is a frequent image of God in Scripture, and especially of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You can check those references. The phrase without hands is used in Scripture to mean not by human power and refers to something that only God can do. It appears that the Roman Empire will in some way continue until the end of the age and culminate in the rule of ten kings. The world will be delivered from evil, not by a process, but by a crisis, the promised return of Jesus Christ. And whatever remains of the four Gentile kingdoms passed from one kingdom to the next will be destroyed and turned into chaff. And then Christ will establish his kingdom, which will fill all the earth. Anyone looking forward to that day? Let me share with you three takeaway truths, and we're almost done. Here it is. How do we counter culture today? Here's what I'd say. Know who you are and who you're not. You're forgiven. You're free. You've been made part of a family. You have a new focus. You have a function, and you have a future. Know who you are in Christ. Number two, speak the truth. That's what Daniel did. Boy, he didn't just come out, though, like Clint Eastwood, though. Boom, 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 boom. Here's the truth bomb, right? No, no, no. Truth with tact. And then number three, here's what I would say. May you and I, may we build our life on the rock who was and who is to come. That's what it looks like to live surrendered. That's what it looks like to counter culture. Jesus is coming again. I can't wait for Dave Clark to be here in second service because you know what he's going to say? Amen. So let me try that one more time. <laughs> Jesus is coming again. Amen. That forms our perspective on this week. He's coming again. I need to have my focus and my function aligned with that truth. And may that rock be the foundation that we build our lives upon. Let's wrap up this chapter. It says in verse 46, King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel. Nebi, Nebi doesn't get it right here. He, he pays attention. Daniel, you're, he starts to worship him. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incenses before him. Daniel, your Instagram account is blown up. People love you. And the king said to Daniel, I love this though. Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, the revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. And the king appointed Daniel to a high position, gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the province of Babylon. Man, God can do more in a moment than you can do in a whole lifetime trying to create something. <laughs> He's chief over all the wise men. This, this like second string guy, all of a sudden. And at Daniel's request, the king appointed, Daniel didn't forget his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. Daniel lived in a strange world of Babylon, but he had a surrendered life, countering culture by simply surrendering his life into the capable hands of God. Instead of being conformed by the world around him, he just was simply committed to God, and God transformed his life. You heard me share this a couple weeks ago, but I'd like to share it one more time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this, one act of obedience is better than listening to a hundred sermons. 
What will you do with this truth this week? Will you begin actually praying for someone? Will you know who you are? Will your words to your children be truth, but truth with tact? Will you build your week's priorities, schedule, agenda, acquisitions, projects, and plans upon the rock that is Jesus Christ, who was and who is to come, or will you not? There's no middle ground. You're either leaning in or you're leaning back. You're either initiated or you're not. It's not about perfection. It's about progress. I'm leaning into that, all right? I'm not like anyone batting a 1,000. I never met a baseball player that batted a 1,000. Not even in T-ball do they bat a 1,000. Do you know that? You ever been to a T-ball game? They miss it. And that's okay. Nobody bats a 1,000. But are you swinging? Like, what function has God given you in his kingdom? Are you a part of that? Or are you just building your own kingdom? Bro, you're missing it. No wonder life's not fun. Do you know that you're forgiven? Do you know that you're free? Are you part of the family of God that he's placed you in? Are you connecting? Do you even know God? Have you ever surrendered your life to him? Have you ever said, Lord, I remember my... Oh, goodness gracious. I, can't, I don't have time to share this with you. I remember where I was at age 19 living in Marietta, California, the desert. Anyone ever been to the desert? I lived there for two years. Now, it wasn't too bad. It was a retreat center that had natural hot springs, so I don't want you to make it think it was too bad. But it was the desert. The water was hot and sulfur, and it was way away from the ocean. I never lived like there in my whole life. My skin was drying out. Anyway, but I will never forget at the age of 19, sitting in a Sunday evening chapel service, and the pastor who was speaking shared his testimony. And I was like, man, I kind of feel like maybe that's my story. And I'll never forget this, saying this. Well, Lord, I think I've already screwed it up at age 19. I feel like I'm done. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, and mentally, I'm tapped. Tried my way. Didn't really work that well. So I'm sorry. And uh, if you can do anything with what's left, I'm open. And that's all I've ever known how to do since that time. I, I don't remember how old I am. I'm 42. <laughs> I was born in 81. So however many years that is between being 19 and 42, I'll be 43 later this year, that's all I've ever known how to do. I don't know what to do. I already tried my way. It didn't work. So whatever you do, that's what I do. Wherever you go, that's where I go. Whatever you say, that's what I say. And I don't know where that's going to end. But here's what I've seen with six children and four or five homes that my wife have owned and almost 17 years of marriage. This week marks the week 17 years ago that I said, Cece, what do you think about getting married? She said yes, and she continues to say yes, which is amazing. Um, and life is like this. That's what life seems like. I've never seen life like this. I would love it to be, but it's not. So I just keep doing this. Lord, I realize and recognize that you're a Savior that I need. I repent of my sins. And God, I receive you. You say, what do you mean you get saved every day? Not theologically, no, of course. It's not something you have to do every time you come. To... But do you kind of like surrender every day? Yes, because I wake up every day and I'm still me. Does that make sense? And I, and I still need God. And I don't know where you are today, but I know that you're somewhere. And I know to a certain degree, you need to be reminded that God loves you. And there's probably one, two, or 85 things that you may be I should probably repent of that. Change my mind about it. That's what repent means. I should think the way God thinks. And I should re receive his grace afresh. And I should live forgiven and free and a part of a family with a new focus 
and a function to play and a future to have. That's what I want. So in just a moment, we're going to invite the worship team up, and we're going to do this today. This will be a little different today. I want to give you a clear next step, no matter who you are. Never heard about Jesus, or like me. We didn't have pews, but the old phrase is you teethed on the back of a pew. I know what that's like. I mean, I grew up in the South. The, the Bible is, you know, kind of our belt. Not always our source of truth, of what we really believe how we really spend our money. I was talking to a pastor from uh, Laguna Beach, California this morning who just moved to Panama City, and he goes, man, this place is so interesting, so different here. Like, I'm so used to churches that teach the Bible, preach the gospel, and make disciples, and most of them are like that. I said, bro, here in, in the South, everyone's a Christian, but no one is. Christianity is our culture. On the West Coast, man, they're a little bit more honest about Islamic faith. Buddhism, the Tao Te Ching, whatever, or nuns, people that don't believe anything. And so you meet people and they got these different paradigms and they're going for it. They're all about being a nun. No, God's not real. In the South, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Football, sweet tea, Jesus, Taylor Swift, throw it all in there. That's what the South is, right? <laughs> it's all part of our culture. Well, don't misunderstand that comment that in the South, everyone's a Christian that no one is. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I'm saying you live in a very hard area. Why? Because Christianity is part of your culture. But God doesn't call you to be a Christian. That's what people call you. If you read the Bible, the etymology of that word, it's not something that Jesus said, I want a lot of Christians. He never said that. He said, I want you to follow me. And then as you're following him, people started to say, you're like a little Christ. You're like a Christian. See, a Christian is something that others should say about you, not something that you should have to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. No. No, no, no. You should say, yeah, I follow Jesus. People go, I can see that. You just like that guy. That's what it's like.